Um, perfect. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining this, joining us for this um, special InShep lecture series um, in recognition of World AIDS Day. Um, I'm Lisa Eaton. I'm a professor of human development and family sciences, and uh, myself and Dr. Seth Kelichman, who's a professor in psychological sciences, will be moderating our panel today. And um, we're very grateful to have um, Dr. Wilton and Dr. Tucker, who will be um, presenting. So if you're not familiar with World AIDS Day, World AIDS Day um, occur, occurs every, it, it occurs yearly since actually 1988. Um, and it, it always occurs on December 1st. Um, it was largely seen as the first global public health awareness campaign. So we've been doing this for a lot of years. And, and in this year's particular theme is, um, which is directed by the UNAIDS, is on global solidarity and shared responsibility. Um, and, and UNAIDS has described that as basically meaning that we have um, a global shared responsibility to address um, gender, race, um, and, and other related health disparities. And, and what we've seen in this past year is the intersection with that, and of course, COVID, and how um, COVID uh, has actually mirrored the HIV epidemic in a lot of ways. So for, the, for this past year, that's been the um, general spirit of the campaign. Um, so in honor of that, INSHIP put together a panel where we can highlight some of the research that's doing just that. And um, so I'm very excited um, to be able to introduce to you all Dr. Leo Wilton. Um, he'll be our first speaker. Dr. Wilton is currently a professor of human development at um, SUNY Binghamton University. He received his MA and his PhD at NYU and his MPH at UMass Amherst. Um, so his research expertise is primarily focused in the areas of health disparities and inequities as re they relate specifically to HIV prevention. A lot of his work is also um, focused on intersectionality, in particular, um, his research looks at the intersection of race, gender, and sexuality inequalities um, among Black communities, both nationally, uh, both in national and international settings. Um, and I can say personally, I'm very familiar with and I've followed Dr. Wilton's program of research for many years. Um, his work has influenced my own streams of research. So um, I was very excited to be able to um, uh, to have to have him join us today, um, and I'm excited to have the opportunity to be able to introduce him. So, without further ado, um, Dr. Wilton, uh, we'll go ahead and, and speak for about 20 minutes. Okay. Oh. So, good afternoon. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Eaton, Dr. Kalishman, Dr. Gorin, and everyone. I'm so delighted to be here remotely to talk with um, everyone for a few minutes in reflection and commemoration on World AIDS Day and so forth. And I wanted to engage us in, if we're thinking about global solidarity and shared responsibility in relation to health and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and inequalities, I wanted to talk about theorizing for a bit and interdisciplinarity because I think it's very, very important um, if we're thinking about addressing, you know, the HIV epidemic. And so what I did was I put together some thoughts um, around uh, some of these issues. And so I've, I'm calling this um, the transformation of silence into language and action. It's taken actually, a title is taken um, from a very classic essay by Audre Lorde, who I'll talk about in a moment or so, but it's about theorizing um, black sexualities research and addressing HIV related health inequities for black men uh, who have sex with men. And if we think about um, Audre Lorde, Audre Lorde, you know, identified herself as a writer, as a professor, as a poet, as an essayist, as a professor, um, as an activist, as a black woman, a lesbian who was of Caribbean heritage, who grew up in New York City in Harlem, she transitioned to um, cancer in 1992. But when we think about um, 
you know, theoretical frameworks, you know, I'm going to invite some reflection on the importance of interdisciplinarity within um, social justice and human rights contexts. And from one of her essays, I think um, I would like to cite here, unless one lives and loves in the trenches, it is difficult to remember that the war against dehumanization is ceaseless. And I wanted to start with these words because I think that in terms of what the enormity of what Audre Lorde's work embodies, it helps us to reflect on very core um, different things. One is the um, socio-historical and political context, you know, of the work that's happening, but also it helps us to reflect on the current moment in terms of where we are and the interrelationship between socio-historical and political context and the contemporary moment. So we can be thinking about, for example, Black Lives Matter movement within an intersectional frame, right? And, um, but also I think it really helps us to engage a conversation around paradigm shift. And that's what I wanna talk about today in relation to addressing structural inequalities within interdisciplinary uh, context. But just to give a, a, a brief cap, I wanna summarize, you know, um, maybe a, a several hundred <laughs> studies and what we know in terms of the state of the field in terms of black same gender practicing men's communities in relation to um, some of the core factors that reflect increased vulnerability for HIV. So we have infrequent HIV and STI testing, late HIV diagnosis, acute HIV infection, undiagnosed, untreated um, HIV STI infections, and of course the interrelationship that often gets neglected, um, you know, between HIV and STIs, you know, uh, viral and bacterial and so forth, higher concentrations of HIV and STIs among sexual networks, um, suboptimal viral su uh, suppression, linkage, engagement, retention and care, et cetera. But also um, in terms of the backdrop of this, one of the core foundations is we need to be also focusing on some of the socio structural cultural contexts of the work. So what we know is that some of the core uh, factors here, we have educational inequalities in the community, insufficient income, um, higher unemployment, underemployment, issues around housing instability, incarceration, mass incarceration. There's a lot of emphasis um, looking at uh, mass incarceration. There's a lot of, um, within the context of the current discourse right now in the public discourse, um, inadequate and of course, inadequate access to healthcare and treatment, also in terms of uh, PrEP and so forth. And um, also it's important, some of the work that we know also, we have like uh, more from an intersectional framework, racism-based stigma and discrimination, uh, homophobia-based stigma and discrimination. And I put the emphasis on racism and homophobia so that we can keep it embedded within the structural forces as opposed to the identities, which is important. And religious institutions and stigma, HIV stigma and discrimination. But if we think about these sorts of things, but more from an intersectional frame, which I'll talk about shortly, but I also want us to invite um, some uh, reflection on how all of these factors kind of interact on multiple levels. And so we have, you know, the structural forces that I talked about that are operating, the community level, you know, factors, you know, that are happening within community, um, intra-community, interpersonal, so friendships, family, that sort of thing, on the individual level in terms of behavior. And, um, and as all of these different factors are coalescing, and just to just talk, talk about two or three brief uh, recent studies that kind of, you know, uh, some of my own work with some of my colleagues, you know, we had a the HBTN um, 061 study and uh, based on some of that, some of the things that we published, one of the articles is that we found one study that we were looking at some of the structural forces. And so we found that unemployment, financial and housing instability was shown to relate to HIV sexual risk behavior and STI diagnosis. So for example, just to highlight, you know, just some of the recent job loss was 
you know, related to um, condom lists and sort of, you know, intercourse. Recent conviction uh, was related to having an STI infection at six months. Unstable housing was related to having an STI infection, you know, at 12 months. And the issue around mental health also is very, very important. Um, and I think it needs more consideration, especially as psychologists. And But within that, looking at the role of sexual trauma and mental health in relation to HIV and STI inequities. So uh, we published a paper in the American Journal of Public Health um, in 2015. And it was one of the first uh, to really look at the role in a large scale data set uh, sexual trauma. And, you know, um, and you can see here in terms of the prevalence was very, very high. So sex before the age um, 12 years with someone at least five years older was 31.1%. Unwanted sex um, when aged 12 to 16 years was about 30%. Intimate partner violence was about 51.8% and high, you know, uh, prevalence of depression and so forth. And one of the things we found was that, you know, childhood sexual abuse when age 12 to 16 did relate to um, engagement in any receptive condomless anal sex with a male um, partner. And also um, within that same study, pressured or forced sex related to having any receptive anal sex, experiencing childhood sexual abuse when younger than 12 years was uh, linked to or physical abuse, uh, emotional abuse, or having been stalked, any of those type of behaviors were linked to having uh, three or more, the report of uh, three or more um, partners in the last six months. So that just gives us like a general backdrop. So I just summarized several hundred articles within a couple of minutes. <laughs> but so what I really wanna talk about though, is uh, where I began to um, um, frame, and that is around interdisciplinarity. And, you know, I would like to invite us in some conversation around thinking about how we are, you know, addressing HIV related health inequities for uh, Black same gender practicing men's communities. And part of that, part of that, you know, uh, relates to theoretical frameworks that are grounded in culturally congruent conceptualizations. And if we're talking about the development and implementation of interventions, they need to be based on good theory, solid, you know, theory and so forth. So what I am, um, you know, uh, inviting us to reflect on is paradigm shift, which is what I'll talk about. And I think that a critical analytic framework for HIV prevention research you know, um, which I think links to theory, methodologies, and praxis um, incorporates a connection to the intersection then, for example, of racial, gender, sexual, and social class politics, which um, relates to, you know, a paradigm shift that links HIV prevention with an interdisciplinary, right, and intersectional frameworks. Um, and this piece is here is very, very important because they have to be relevant to the lived experiences of what's happening on the ground level, the everyday lived experiences of Black same gender practicing men's communities. And, uh, but if we take a, if we're thinking about interdisciplinarity, um, if we're thinking about paradigm shift, an important key component is thinking about socio historical, political, and cultural contexts of some of this work. And um, there's a foundational text um, that I like to work from. There are several, but there's one in particular, it's called Race in North America. And it's by um, an African-American woman anthropologist um, who recently passed away, uh, Audrey Smedley. And um, the later versions of the text have now been published with you know, her son, Brian Smedley, who is a clinical psychologist. And, um, and I think her work on race is very foundational to helping us think about implications about the impact of scientific racism over a few centuries on medicine has been well documented in the literature. For example, the book Medical Apartheid, you know, by Harriet Washington, but there are several texts that kind of do this. Um, and the pathologies of Black sexualities is important to consider and think about. So really looking at Black sexualities and really moving beyond um, you know, very Western Eurocentric patriarchal and heteronormative frameworks 
and but also thinking about how the history of medical abuse experimentation and exploitative research links to um, the current moment, right? So of course we can, you know, some of the classic studies around Tuskegee syphilis experiment, but we have a few hundred years of some of this research, you know, um, you know, even starting from very problematic gynecological experiments that were done on enslaved African women here in the US. Um, and then since then, all the way forward. So um, even more recently in the 90s, guinea pig kids where, you know, um, African American and Latino, Latina, Latinx children, foster care children were subjected to um, AIDS experimental drugs in the 90s, that sort of thing. So it's here with us and how um, these sorts of pieces link with the current moment. Right, we can look at like um, Dr. Eaton had mentioned, like COVID. I mean, it's it, this is all front and center in terms of COVID, right? In terms of vaccinations, right? So all of these histories and the interrelationships then around HIV, STIs, even COVID, are all operating here around cultural mistrust about the medical establishment. And so when I'm talking about interdisciplinarity. You know, the other important piece here is we have to, um, you know, think about how knowledge is developed. And um, so meaning that the production of knowledge and what constitutes quote unquote legitimate knowledge. Is it just, you know, randomized control trials, you know, uh, which is perceived as being the gold standard or, you know, are there other forms of knowing that are more culturally grounded Right, that are important to you know black same gender practice in men's communities, black communities or communities of color more broadly. And in the field of public health and even in psychology, the building of knowledge in HIV prevention, you know, has been based on um, by and large, by and large, in a very substantive way, epistemological and theoretical frameworks and biomedical and epidemiologic uh, research. And um one one thinker, but there are many, but one person I like to work from um, in her book, uh, one book, um, you know, that uh, she, but there's actually several books that um, she has published and so forth, but the work of Kathy Cohen, right? Um, and what I like about her work and um, those uh, others within the genre is that we could be looking at concepts of, um, stigma, marginalization, and structural inequalities and that provide a conceptual framework, you know, for addressing asymmetrical power relationships in Black communities. And when I say asymmetrical power relationships, I mean power inequalities, right, and including those that um, help us think about the socio-historical and political experiences of exclusion and marginalization, some of the ones I just named just a few moments ago, right, um, and as these pieces also linked to the current pulse of the movement of the moment. And the other important piece of this work, um, I think, is helping us to think about the duality of examining macro and micro level processes. So macro, larger structural forces that are operating, but also what's happening at the micro level within communities in terms of like secondary marginalizations based on gender, gender identity, gender expression, issues around sexuality, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. And um, I'll be closing within um, a couple of moments or so, but another important, um, another highlight, there's a significant um, body of research on Black queer studies that I think is so relevant in helping us to think through interdisciplinarity. Um, especially if we're conducting research, you know, at the ground level, you know, within Black communities, Black queer communities, and so forth, that really engage um, very robust, very innovative, culturally grounded, interdisciplinary, intersectional approaches, and that um, help us to think beyond, uh, moving beyond um, disciplinary boundaries and helping us to think through how to integrate multiple bases of knowledge, right? And um, an important component of this that often gets neglected is around power relationships, right? So the relations between the relations between dominance and subordination in our everyday lives, meaning like what are the structural forces that are operating 
within society. And there are different folks also around intersectionality like Kimberly Crenshaw um, help us think through, you know, some of her pioneering work, you know, around that. And um, one of the things that uh, Kimberly Crenshaw would articulate is that we need to consider the structural and dynamic consequences of the interaction between two or more axes of domination. So what is the relationship then um, of race, you know, ethnicity, gender, you know, social class, sexuality, um, and other axes, you know, of domination, immigration status is very, very expensive. Um, and so if we're thinking about, you know, some of these frameworks and then, you know, in relation to paradigm shift, um, in terms of helping us, you know, think through global solidarity and shared responsibility um, around health inequalities, you know, within these frameworks. So then how do we train people? You know, how do we like do this work, right? How do we engage um, some of these um, core principles of this work? And I think, you know, there are many ways to kind of do it right? Um, but in the interest of time, just some of the basic things then, and I'm sure folks will have, you know, you know, some other thoughts around these, but, you know, the importance of, of the research to Black gay men's communities, right? So it's not just about, you know, us as researchers going in and conducting the research, but what do the communities themselves want? You know, what are, what did they envision for the research, right? Um, how do they want to frame, you know, the research, you know, from the ground up perspective? And that's easier said than done, right? And, but also thinking about how we strengthen the capacity, you know, of um, Black gay men, for example, in academic and community context to conduct research too. So how do we begin to kind of think about building infrastructure within um, Black communities, you know, so when we're doing research in Black communities, at the same time, I would invite us to think about, well, how do we build infrastructure at the same time? How do we truly engage, you know, partnership in those sorts of pieces? So partnerships are very, very, very important um, with community-based organizations. And I would also add here indigenous ones, meaning like, you know, examples would be um, uh, indigenous Black gay organizations that have been around since the known of time who, you know, have strong connections within um, Black gay men's communities and that sort of piece. But at this, I think I've reached my time, so um, we can stop here, but there's lots to kind of talk about and reflect on. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so, so very much for that. Um, <clears throat> I know, I mean, sitting here listening to you talk, I think, each slide could be like a whole dissertation mm -hmm. there's so much <laughs> mm -hmm. you know i feel like i've been doing this work for a while and i'm thinking and i'm i'm sitting here writing down notes of things that i need to look into further and and, and so i feel like we need like a, a post discussion um reading list mm -hmm. would be helpful <laughs> um so so thank you um very well put together um and, and thought provoking so i think we'll go right into our next um <clears throat> into our next uh, presenter um dr joe tucker um and we'll have, so we'll have another uh, 15 to 20 minutes and, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions unless i'm wrong i don't know melanie are you out there that sound about right that sounds right okay um <clears throat> all right so so now we're switching gears a little bit um i'm also very excited to introduce um, Dr. Joseph Tucker. Um, Dr. Tucker is currently an associate professor in the Department of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases, and he also serves as a director of Project China um, at the University of North Carolina. He received his MA at Harvard University, his PhD at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and medical degree at, at UNC. His primary areas of research interest include a focus on community-based interventions, um, and particularly uh, leveraging crowdsourcing methods to um, generate novel ideas about um, developing interventions. 
He's used crowdsourcing techniques as a way to enhance HIV service delivery and to improve HIV and STI testing services. So I'm very excited to hear about um, Dr. Tucker's research. So please join me in welcoming him. Thanks, Dr. Eaton. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Great, and you can see the slides. Great. Um, and thanks, Dr. Wilton, for that talk. I mean, really fascinating talk and um, so rich and, and um, well-grounded. It was really um, wonderful. And I um, uh, and thanks um, to Dr. Eaton and, the, and Dr. Kalsman and the organizers. Um, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to give this talk today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about person-centered HIV research and um, so, and I'll talk a little bit about um, framing and what is this term, what, what do we mean by people-centered or person-centered, and then I'll talk a little bit about some methods to, um, to engage communities and, um, and identify sort of community ideas. So, I'll talk a little bit about crowdsourcing, hackathons, and then um, a pay it forward project that's, um, that was developed through crowdsourcing. So, what is pe people centered or person centered? Um, the UNAIDS 2020 report this year, Prevailing Against Pandemics, was focused on uh, people centeredness and called out this concept. And their definition of it is people living with HIV and communities at risk at the center. So, not thinking as much about the medical infrastructure but really thinking about who's using services, how can we imp improve services um, from the perspective of, of the end user. And it also really links together social um, interventions and, and health services in a, in a more explicit way and recognizes the larger social determinants of health that often drive inequalities as, as Dr. Wilton um, nicely pointed out. And in terms of how is this sort of bottom up grassroots or top down, I see this as sort of a combination of both that you have to have a really strong grassroots energy and sort of community force. And at the same time, there needs to be a space from the top um, to sort of let this, um, let the grassroots energy um, develop and mature. So crowdsourcing, um, is one way to develop more person-centered services. Crowdsourcing has a group of people to solve a problem and then shares or implements solutions with the public. And Wikipedia is a great example of this outside of public health um, where people can volunteer and contribute to this online encyclopedia. And then the output of this, the, the website is free to use without charges associated with it. So. Um, why crowdsourcing in the health domain? Like why why focus on this? They're in expanding digital networks, and I think with COVID, this is even deeper and sort of richer. There are insights from many fields suggesting that groups can be wise, that there's group genius, and there's there are big data sets that are available. So what is what does crowdsourcing look like? What are some of the activities? This could be an innovation challenge, an open contest. There are a couple of different names, but basically all of these have some kind of open solicitation um, where a group of individuals can respond and then evaluation and um, recognizing exceptional entries. This could be used to develop logos or images or videos, messaging. Um, it has been used in pharmaceutical drug development and diagnostics, although in a very limited sense. And then hackathons are another example. It's more of a sprint-like event over a brief period of time. And I'll talk a little bit more about those. And then online collaboration systems are another example of crowdsourcing. So taking the open call as an example, what does that look like or how does it work? Um, typically, it starts with organizing a community steering group. And those people could be people living with HIV, um, they could be black gay men. It really depends on sort of what the focus of the open call is. And then engaging the community to contribute. 
um, through in-person means, through digital means, getting the word out, evaluating contributions based on pre-specified criteria, and then recognizing finalists either through mentorship or a, a prize infrastructure, and then finally sharing solutions and implementing. Um, and that could be through a formal research study or um, or just implementing um, the best ideas or seeing them sort of fully realized. We, our team has done a fair amount of research um, using crowdsourcing contests for sexual health and focused on increasing HIV testing um, among gay men in China, uh, increasing condom use, thinking about what does HIV cure mean, um, enhancing disclosure, increasing STD testing. So this gives you some flavor of, of some of the research that, that, um, that our team has done focused on using open calls as a tool um, for engagement and, and enhancing health services. And then in the COVID era, um, um, another example is the Carolina Collective Open Call. And here we used crowdsourcing to inform the fall semester at UNC. And I know that the University of Connecticut actually had a similar kind of um, open call. Um, and the UNC one had ended up having a total of 110 submissions. Um, seven ideas had a mean score of eight out of 10 or, or better. And there were some really wonderful ideas that we shared with the UNC leadership. I would also add that this is sort of, um, could be a valuable tool for social listening and um, getting a pulse of, of like what, what's going on in the community. In the, in the late part of the summer, people were freaking out at UNC. And, and you know, this is, like at many campuses, there was a lot of tension and anxiety. And um, to have a more formal way to bring these concerns from staff, from faculty, from students to the leadership, I think that was useful. Um, even though at the end of the day, the Board of Governors is still, um, you know, they're, they were the ones making the final decisions about um, the details of reopening. But I think these kinds of community engagement tools are really useful for um, in, in many different contexts. So, and then hackathons, another um, way to develop um, sort of community-based um, HIV services. Hackathons are a multi-step process. Oftentimes they start with an open call and then there'll be a sprint event over two to three days. And then finally some follow-up activities this is a way to encourage multidisciplinary collaboration. Um, and this photo on the right here is from a hackathon last year where we um, worked with local gay men in China to develop a mobile phone application that helped men get to gay friendly doctors and access prep services. So um, it's, I think this is another um, uh, a way that that hackathons can be used outside of the HIV sphere and in the sort of COVID universe, Germany had um, a, a hackathon online, 26,581 people participated. So the largest hackathon in the world is called We Versus Virus. And um, they ended up generating um, hundreds of ideas and several of the ideas were implemented. Um, and I think the other interesting thing that came out of this German hackathon is that people who participated um, felt it, it, it gave them sort of an explicit way to contribute and it increased trust in the German government related to the COVID response. So um, having a more transparent and formal way that people's ideas could um, could contribute to policy, I think, has has um, a lot of merit. Um, so then, the final example that I'll talk a little bit about is called Pay It Forward. And um, here, Pay It Forward is um, giving a gift to someone, so um, a free health service from someone who cares. So in the context of gonorrhea or or um, chlamydia testing, this is giving someone a free gonorrhea test and saying someone in your local community cares about you 
this is a free test. And then after they um, they decide to get tested or not, and then um, they we ask them, would you like to donate money to um, support subsequent people to get tested, or to write a handwritten message to um, to encourage other people to get tested? And so um, we developed this sort of pay it forward project in Guangzhou iteratively with community involvement. So the logo that you see on the right was developed through an open call with local MSM. And um, we, we received a, a, a huge, a, a large number of um, really nice messages, artwork. Um, these are just a few examples of quotes that, um, and, and I think it's, there was really substantial generosity um, among gay men. And this is sort of on the messaging side. And then on the finance side, um, in our initial pilot, 89% of men who um, tested chose to donate something to future participants. So really high rates of paying it forward, surprisingly high rates, given that, um, that people could take the free test and walk away if they wanted to. Um, and then building on that, that pilot, um, we decided to do um, a small randomized control trial. And um, this is Kathy Lee, the med student at the time who um, designed the study. And she did a tremendous job. And basically sort of three um, arms, um, there was paying the sort of conventional arm standard of care was um, you pay for your own gonorrhea and chlamydia test. Um, and then the pay it forward arm, we had people who came in, these are gay men in China who would come into a clinic to get, they were coming in for an HIV test um, that was free. And then we asked, we said, the local gay men in this community care about you. Um, we're, you're, you're receiving a um, gonorrhea and chlamydia test free of charge today, um, and then um, ask uh, if they would like to pay it forward. And then the final arm was pay it what you want, where they would receive a free STD test, but then the amount that they paid was totally up to them. So they could also pay nothing, they could pay a small amount. Um, and then looking, this is just sort of a flow chart of um, the people that were approached, um, and it ended up being about 300 MSM who were assigned to these three different study arms. And in the standard of care arm, about 18% um, paid for their own gonorrhea and chlamydia tests. In the pay it forward arm, 56% received a test. And then in the pay, pay what you want arm, 46% um, received a test. And so you can see that this is a pretty big jump in STD testing and pay it forward as an intervention has two components to it. There's sort of the free part of it. And then there's also the community engagement and the caring aspect and the pay it what you want. Um, this sort of third arm helps us to understand a little bit more that, um, that there is a pretty big effect of, of um, the, the finances of this being free or paying whatever you'd like. But then there's also um, an additional impact of this sort of caring community engagement. Um, and this is granted, this is you know a single small study. And I think what Dr. Wilton said about RCTs, completely agree that um, we kind of overemphasize RCTs at the, um, at, at, and we need to think more about um, the big picture. So, um, if you're interested in open calls and crowdsourcing, our team worked in partnership with the WHO to put together a practical guide. This is all online. Um, there's a bunch of other crowdsourcing projects that we have going on right now. Um, and just a few caveats. So crowdsourcing is not a panacea. There's, there are obviously ethical considerations need to think about logistics and avoiding the Bodhi Mc, McBoat face effect. Um, and, and also, I think, sharing back with the public um, that crowdsourcing 
is not just about taking things from groups, but it's thinking really carefully about how can we give back to groups and communities and, and the public. So um, uh, I'd like to thank our SESH team in Guangzhou and again, the um, INCHIP team and the University of Connecticut. Um, and um, over to Dr. Kalchman and Dr. Eaton. Thank you so much. It was, um, <clears throat> I also feel in that case that we could probably talk for hours because <laughs> um, there's so many interesting streams of research occurring there that I, I could see just being so timely um, and so timely and so very novel and moving multiple different fields forward um, in exciting ways. So um, <clears throat> grateful to both of you for, um, for, for all the work you're doing and, and, and what you're sharing with us today. Um, and amazingly, we're also on time. Um, so <laughs> congrats to us for that. Um, so, so now we have the, the remaining time to answer questions and, and um, ha have discussion um, with, I, with I, either of our presenters. Um, do we have any questions? I, I have a question. Okay, and then we'll get Natalie. Natalie, go ahead. Sorry, it took me a while to find the mute button. Uh, <laughs> so I was really interested in, um, th uh, obviously, thank you both for, for talking with us and taking the time to come out. Um, I was interested in how you both touched on um, RCTs a bit, and this might be a bit played out, but especially for uh, Dr. Wilton, I know that I've been focusing a lot on uh, critical race theory a bit, and I know that you're looking so much at these intersectional and um, very in-depth kind of uh, structural, individual, everything coming together um, factors. And I was wondering, um, you know, where you see RCTs going, if you think that personal narratives really should take more of a focus here. Am I off mute? Okay, good, 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 good. Thank you, Natalie, uh, for your questions. Nice to meet with you and to talk with you. Um, I want to um, disclose that I do RCTs <laughs> and I believe in them. <laughs> At the same time, I want, uh, you know, I want us to be critical of them and how they kind of get positioned too, right? You know, and, um, and really moving beyond um, and, and not um, just using RCTs, you know, as thinking of other forms of knowing and knowledge base and really valuing them, just like exactly what you said. And I love the fact that you said, you know, you're working with critical race theory. It's so applicable, you know, um, to interdisciplinarity, especially, you know, the personal narrative, um, but also the paradigm shift around, you know, knowledge production there, um, the centrality of the voices of folks in the community, you know, there. Um, so perhaps, you know, we can have multiple ways of knowing, um, but I, I, at the same time, I do think that, um, you know, we have to think about knowledge production and what gets valued and to really challenge that and what's important to the communities, right? At the ground level, what's important to people? and so forth. So the valuing of, for example, qualitative methodological approaches, you know, critical um, ethnography, you know, critical race ethnography, you know, you mentioned um, critical race theory too. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's a hall hallelujah qu uh, chorus with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Um, and, I, and I wanna encourage you to, to continue to do it and move forward because we need more people doing it. Absolutely. Um, Christine, do you have a question? Yeah, um, once again, thanks for the talk. Um, 
my master's thesis, I also used a quote from Audre my thesis, so I'm familiar with her work. Mm -hmm. um, except mine was more focused on her uh, erotic power and erotic oh, energy mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to race theory. Yeah. So, um, yeah. but I think this is kind of a question for, for both of you gentlemen. When I heard you talk, a lot of what we're hearing and COVID and HIV, and, and I do look at a lot of qualitative work, is this medical mistrust aspect. And I'm curious if Joe's mechanisms of like crowdsourcing could assist research, research beyond things that we already think we know, because we think we know a lot about stigma and intersectionality. But I, I get a sense that it grows it goes deeper for the people who are living that those lot lived experiences, and that perhaps a, a crowdsourcing mechanism could inform future research. What do you think about that, gentlemen? Um, thanks, Christine. And I I think um, you you're definitely right that like there's a lot of pushback against sort of experts and authorities and um, some of it probably based on, you know, there, there's some of it that, that's, that's more like truth-based and some of it's that, that's more um, falsehoods. And the, there, there's definitely a whole field of like social media research and digi digital research that's taking data from social media um, and and trying to make sense of it and thinking about um, how can we um, look at misinformation in sort of a critical way. And so the um, Heidi Larson's group at the London School has done some really nice work with vaccine confidence and sort of tapping into how can we do kind of social listening in a um constructive way um and i think in terms of like could this be a tool for um for developing either hypotheses or research questions um i i personally feel like it's it's useful but it would you'd have to have like it you need to find the right way to like to approach the group that you want to reach so like if it's black gay men, you'd need to find a way that really resonated with black gay men so that they would be so that like the process of contributing wouldn't out them or stigmatize them or um but I think you know um there was a great um podcast um that that came out that was um all about um these stories where women had been sexually harassed and it was recording little snippets of like audio like um audio files of and and each of these files was um was basically anonymized using software but then um their stories were um were shared back and it was incredibly powerful um, but I'm I'm also really interested to hear Dr. Wilton's take on this. What What are your thoughts? No, I appreciate. I, you know, I think there was so much synergy, you know, between our presentations. And as you were talking, I was like, okay, this is wonderful. <laughs> you know, I absolutely, you know, agree with you. And I think that, you know, um, if we look at the current moment, it's so heavy right now. Babe. And um, it's heavy, you know, if we think about like the centrality of Black Lives Matter movement um, and so forth. And, you know, um, a number of folks always make reference to the summer, but I want to challenge that a little bit and say, you know, it's always been like that for Black folks and Brown folks, right? So I said, okay, so people are starting to catch up, <laughs> but it's always felt heavy to us. Right, like before, way before Trayvon Martin in 2012 was murdered in Florida, right? We've always, you know, black folks have, have always been murdered, right? It's never, it's been never ending and never stopping. And so this, this, this um, question around dehumanization, I think is so central and so important 
for us to engage and as especially as folks you know experience it in the everyday you know on the ground level um, but the humanization at the root as it relates to structural inequalities but it's so 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 heavy right now and i like to refer to black lives matter because you know the co-founders of black lives matter really framed it within beautifully within an intersectional framework although in the public discourse it also it often gets male centered right but the three founders are three black women, some of whom identify as queer. <laughs> and so if we look at the conceptualization of Black Lives Matter, it, it has been conceptualized with an intersectional frame that equally values the experiences based on race, gender, sexuality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I absolutely concur. You know, I, you know, I just think we need to be in the moment of the movement in terms of where people are and what folks are experiencing in the everyday, especially now. We see like even um, looking on, you know, CNN and on television, you know, the long lines in terms of food insecurity right now, right? And all of these sorts of issues, you know, folks losing their homes. I mean, there's so many, you know, folks struggling to pay the rent. So we have to stay connected, you know, and grounded, um, you know, to what's happening at the ground level in terms of where people, where folks are at in terms of their lived experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, we also have a question um, from Colleen Missler. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you so much for presenting. These are fantastic. And just in our discussions, what I'm thinking about and what, hoping to ask you is do you have any recommendations or considerations for how we could somewhat integrate community-based participatory research, CDPR, with that large-scale crowdsourcing? So how can we kind of get like those in-depth, somewhat qualitative on a large scale? Any recommendations or considerations for even just like the data collection and how we would go about getting that data? So timely. Thanks, Colleen. Um, and I, I think we've used CBPR in a few in a few different ways. One in in um, probably the most common way is to kind of start an open call by doing in depth interviews with community members as a way to get community input on like what's the way to frame this, who should be in the steering committee, like basically kind of set up set the kind of open call up um and i think um there there are also ways that um the structure of a crowdsourcing open call could use cbpr principles in terms of like how do you select judges how do you select participants what are the incentives to participate um to kind of really intentionally tie it into community building and local community structures so um in one example in the chinese context we did a video open uh, we had an open call for videos to promote hiv testing and a lot of community-based organizations cbo's are very weak in china and so this was focused on community-based organizations that like we wanted to hear from these community groups, and so um, it was it was focused on um, CBOs as as the um, participants, and then we also had CBOs as judges and steering committee members. But I think there's definitely a way that um, CBPR could could be kind of the the theoretical approach, or could help to um, structure some of the elements of an open call. Over. Um, great, and now we have a question coming in from Aviana. Hi, thank you both again, mirroring what everyone said. Um, those were really amazing and thought provoking talks. And I kind of have had a question similar to Colleen's. Um, I had never heard of a lot of the kind of novel methods that Dr. Tucker mentioned. Um, I thought the idea of the hackathon was really amazing and a really um awesome way to engage the community and get so much input and i'm kind of just wondering more about that like how 
do you even kind of get started planning a hackathon and putting one together? Um, and how can other researchers um, adapt that into their own research? Thanks, Aviana. Um, and in terms of like, um, what's the what's the sort of prime mover of a hackathon or how do you get started? Um, I think you need to have you need to sort of find your group um, that if it's if it's like people living with HIV or sort of um, focus the question um, and find um, the right kind of steering committee members and and groups to to um, to push an idea forward. There are some open access resources. MIT has like a hacking medicine um, sort of guide that they've produced. Um, there's been, there's some literature on hackathons in, in medicine, um, and they tend to be a little bit more like other hackathons in terms of being somewhat more focused on tech and sort of um, entrepreneurship. So like, the space of um, design of funds where it's more like let's collaboratively design something together for social good. I think those kinds of activities um, are we're starting to see more of those, but I would say they're still very much in their infancy. Um, so, but, um, but I think there's, um, you know, finding sort of like who's the group that you want to um, work with, what's the question or what's the issue that you want to move forward, um, finding some champions and potential steering committee members. Um, and we've done a lot, almost all of our hackathons have been through research studies. So it's really been sort of like, let's write a grant and a research grant and have this be part of a research project. Um, so I think that's, um, that's another kind of way to think about it is within a research study or project, is there, would there be a way to to structure like a designathon or a hackathon, but it's, it's a great question, and and I can put um, some of those links in the um, chat box. Over. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I and I also I have a question too, but I want to pass it over to Seth because I think Seth had a question and. <clears throat> I haven't given Seth much of a chance to moderate, so. <laughs> Seth, did you, I just want to make sure, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, Natalie, I think, might have a question, too. Uh, no? Okay. I was, sorry, I was just going to say you, um, Dr. Tucker, recently had a paper on the MSM-friendly doctor finder that really outlays the hackathon kind of criteria, I think, well. So in case anyone wanted it. So, Thanks, Natalie. I'll put the link in the chat box. But yeah, that one has some references. And um, we, our team has, has thought, so we, we created this like crowdsourcing practical guide. And we've been um, mulling over, like, should we do something similar for hackathons? Um, and I think given that, like, with COVID, there's a lot of digital, like, sort of participatory events, but, um, yeah, sorry, um, Dr. Caltron. So I, you know, so much of, of this, you know, of what you're talking about with the crowdsourcing and using sort of social, you know, um, the sort of social networking to move uh, communities, um, it's uh, sort of like, to me, it sounds a lot like some some things that you know have happened you know public health and in HIV way early on, but not in the, in the tech world in terms of diffusion of innovations and um, and social marketing and things like that. And you know that work had then sort of like for some in, in sort of a next generation became connected to networks and and network researchers kind of grabbed some of those technologies. Do you see that happening here too? Are are sort of networks and, and network functions are sort of a next step or relevant or is it just not like it but these 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 connections just aren't like that it's a great question and i think um network science has a lot to there's a there's a big sort of interface between network science and these approaches and part of it is 
on the digital side of things that if you're looking to promote like in terms of choosing steering committee members or choosing influence like you'd want people who have larger networks or who are influencers um and and then i think some of the interventions that we have developed have been more um either network based or sort of inspired by network so so i think there's there's definitely a lot of um productive crosstalk between kind of network science and um and in these um approaches i guess the um i do think that sometimes network science it's not as community engaged and it's not like it's not um like that's not the focus of it as much so i think there's a little bit of a tension there but um but i'm an optimist at the end of the day i think there's a lot of room for more research and sort of um thinking in this direction over it's interesting thank you yes i think um in the spirit of keeping us on time because we've been on time we we are out of time now um but this has been great and i'm really grateful to the speakers. I'm grateful to Inship for putting this together and um, our, our participants who engage in really thoughtful discussions. So this has been a really wonderful hour to spend with you all. Um, I'd love to hear more about crowdsourcing research. And Leo, I can tell you that next time I see you, I'm going to ask you about the intersection of Black Lives Matter and HIV prevention and treatment. So that was my question, but we've, we're, we're run, we've run out of time. So just um just pin that somewhere and know that i'm i'm that's what i'm going to ask you about next um all right i'm gonna i guess send it back to amy or josh or whomever because i think that our hour together is up i just want to thank everybody as well it's, uh, you know leo and joe for for taking the time to do this also um in shipping and amy for doing this world aids day event and josh for all the tech tech help really appreciate everybody's support in this it's um yeah. It's great. It's great that it's great that Inship does a World AIDS Day event. Thanks, everybody. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Take care. All right. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Happy World AIDS Day. Thank you yes, very much. Wow. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll be in touch. Thank you.